Good morning, everyone. So it's my pleasure to share one of my dissertation paper with you. Um, the title might need more further definition, but we'll get to that. Uh, for now, it's a China-Japan comparison. It's about their policy, uh, state-owned financiers, known as policy banks, and it's about their overseas finance. So I won't be uh, following this uh, PowerPoint uh, point to point is just here for the reference. So I'm going to go through the background as well as some puzzles, uh, literature reviews, and the theoretical framework, uh, data collection, and uh, how do I complete, uh, uh, complete the archival study, and some details about cases, and then some takeaways. So the background of this study, as many of you have already known uh, in the previous day, is about China's uh, recent uh, overseas expansion, including BRI. So China extensively used the kind of uh, uh, state-owned financiers known as policy banks. So they are uh, banks, but uh, they do not compete with uh, other uh, commercial banks. Uh, they compete on national, uh, on international level, but uh, uh, they are supposed to carry out specific state goals and are supposed to encourage um, and, uh, uh, projects that are deemed too risky to uh, encourage to attract uh, private capitals. So China is not the only one using this as a matter of fact. Uh, you can find uh, counterparts to policy banks in uh, other East Asian or even Western economies, even though they do not use the word Zhengzhexing They sometimes use uh, export credit agency or uh, development banks, but uh, it's the same thing. Uh, China and Japan are are two of the major uh, economies that uh, extensively use these uh, state-owned financiers. Chinese and Japanese uh, policy banks, including Export Import Bank of China, uh, China Development Bank, Japan Bank for International Cooperation, and Japan International Cooperation Agencies, are much larger than other uh, policy banks and uh, are comparable to large Western private banks. So these banks are important to both researchers and policymakers, especially in the recent climate of China's expansion. So the nature of these banks lead to a variety of questions. The first question is very evident. Uh, it's a question that uh, people discussed yesterday, uh, whether uh, being state-led means that uh, every project is uh, strategic. Does being financed by one of these uh, policy banks means that uh, the project is part of uh, the grand strategy of uh, investor countries or uh, home countries uh, like China and Japan? So the second question is that second issue is that uh, because of the prevalence of this line of thought, uh, it is uh, often uh, addressed as neo-colonialism or the fault of China and Japan and some other investor countries when a negative event broke out uh, regarding to the project. Uh, and to make things even worse, the nature of state-led finance determined that uh, it's very likely for them to get into areas that uh, private capitals do not dare to go into, such as long uh, projects with a long a cycle of repayment and projects with massive social and environmental impact. So most of these projects focus on infrastructure and energy sectors, and we call that state-led developmental-related project development finance. So one of my previous studies that has been accepted by another journal used combined data from multiple countries on Chinese and Japanese policy banks to study their behavioral pattern. The general finding is that these banks are driven by profit, but they also have a tendency to invest in countries with high political and uh, econo macroeconomic risks. So uh, this leads to the final issue. So while these uh, risks can be evaded by the bank themselves, who possess multiple financial tools, such as a flexible interest rate, uh, mortgage, guarantors, etc., uh, they are definitely harmful of, uh, in uh, for the uh, investor state or home state. So some of them lead to the loss of national assets, and some of them even lead to the loss of uh, national reputation. For example, the infamous uh, Misung Dam in Myanmar. Uh, now, this uh, final question leads to the puzzle, which is this. Is, the, uh, decision, uh, is this the conscient decision of state? Are these uh, what we call the harmful project for the state, a uh, conscient decision part of the national strategy because they are sub uh, 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 financed by uh, state-owned financiers. 
So to understand that, we need to go deeper into the literatures. Um, there are several schools explain, proposing different uh, drivers on the uh, motivations of uh, overseas finance. For example, uh, economic theorists will often say that uh, state-owned financiers are just li uh, acting like uh, private financiers. So they are driven by profit, they are attracted by recipient market or the market of host country, uh, and uh, they are dissuaded by risks. The fact that you sometimes see uh, these banks uh, investing in riskier part of the world means that uh, governmental subsidies, uh, governmental backup, and other favorable policies from China and Japan and other home countries are distorting the market. And of course, there are a second line of thought, which is more prevalent these days. Uh, there are statist models saying that uh, China and other countries, Japan, India to an extent, are using statecraft or what we call the Jinji Wai Jiao, economic diplomacy, to assign uh, political assignment to state owned financiers, uh, state owned enterprises, etc., even though the project is not very profitable in economic terms. Now, empirical evidence can both support and uh, oppose uh, this line of thought, depending on which case you're looking on. Uh, some of the cases in Africa, like uh, Professor Brodigam's study, might oppose the idea and find that uh, uh, some of them are driven by profit. However, there are also cases supporting status uh, uh, theories. The third school is interest group, which uh, claims that uh, both of these drivers uh, can be coexisted and uh, can be coexisting at the same time, and uh, there is no coherent. Uh, uh, that there is no coherent uh, decision making. Instead, uh, the policy is made by uh, bargaining among subnational actors who have their own interests. So, on one hand, you have uh, the uh, you have the distorted policies uh, that uh, uh, fits uh, the interest of of interest groups rather than the interest of. Uh, uh, the entire uh, the entire nation, but on the other hand, you have the nation fighting fragmented authoritarianism or whatever you call it uh, by using strong authority and uh, tools of mobilization. So you can see a lot of case studies using the interest group method, which is also the method I'm going to use. So uh, a lot of them are about uh, uh, contractors, which is the country, uh, which is the investing countries uh, companies in the field, uh, forming circle of uh, compensation with the local government and officials, ministries, interest group, etc., to externalize risk to underrepresented uh, uh, residents. And you can also see the elite politics studies, the patron clientel relationship among the uh, two governments. But the studies about uh, financiers are relatively limited, so I intend to contribute to the field and uh, discussion in that way. So how I'm going to you contribute it. Uh, this is a little different from the version I have, so sorry about that. Finding this. Um, uh, this is uh, the model I want to uh, <coughs> simplify and uh, make it as the base of my, uh, of my dissertation. So I simplified all the interest group actors into four groups. So you have the home government, which has a bunch of ministries, the host government, investor, which is basically the combination of financiers and contractors, and you have the local resistance, which is a combination of uh, local residents, opposing party, uh, maybe local government, NGOs, and even international force. So the bottom three actors are acting on the market. You have the host government um, raising a uh, 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 raising uh, to say a target uh, price or salary, and uh, the local resistance, uh, de uh, depending on their uh, level of resistance, uh, raise the potential cost of the project. And the contractors will weigh the cost and the benefits to decide whether they want to enter, and then they attract uh, financiers to support it. Now, the status model argues that the home government is very powerful, and the statecraft can influence these actors in multiple ways. It can subsidize the uh, investor, which includes uh, the financiers and the respective uh, companies. It can promote uh, the project to the host countries via bilateral diplomatic channel, and it, it can actively intervene during the when uh, a social uprising uh, breaks up. So I'm using this appeal to 
uh, stop project based on one of the cases, so please forget it uh, for now. Uh, and my own model, uh, after preliminarily studying some of the uh, actual cases, uh, is uh, uh, like this. So I argue that uh, the triangular relationship between investor, host, and resistance groups, which is uh, market-oriented and maybe dependent on the domestic politics of host countries, is uh, actually the most uh, determined uh, factor in the formation and implementation of a project. The home government, while having some influence, is relatively inefficient and limited. So in order to study that, I conducted a theory confirming uh, case study. So the subject of the study is to study cases of negative impact. So I only want to study those cases that are problematic. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, planning to do a case of all the investment and study a general pattern. The cases are supposed to be representative of problematic projects, so of all the projects that has problems. These are typical, not outliers. Uh, I use Environmental Justice Atlas database. is sponsored by EU and developed by several academic institutions. And uh, uh, I use two thresholds, uh, bank involvement and uh, violence level above median, which means there is really a social uprest that can be seen on the media uh, to randomly select these cases. And of course, there are also interviews, uh, formal and informal interviews, semi-structured in China and Japan to help me uh, gauge out the feasibility of these cases and find supportive evidence. They can, this can overall be seen as an archival study. Uh, most of these evidence are governmental documents, news report, NGOs, and the interviews are just there to help me organize all these structures. Uh, I don't think this version have the cases, so I'll just talk uh, by them without the, these slides. So uh, I have five cases, five, uh, two of them, uh, the first two, Koto Panja, and Sam Rock Dam's uh, multi uh, functional uh, project are Japanese project. The other three are Chinese. So Merovi and the Maison are mirroring the results and process of uh, Koto Panjan and Sam Rock respectively. And the West City is just here to show a different type of case uh, in which uh, uh, the market is just not very feasible. So even the host government wanted, they cannot do it. Um, Koto Panjan is uh, among the five cases, the only ODA case. So yes, it's a conscient decision of Japanese state. Japan is the only financiers. Uh, it's, uh, uh, completed, it's proposed and completed in early 1990s, and it's completely enforced by the Indonesian government. At that time, the government was authoritarian, and uh, it used the coercive means to evict the residents and uh, uh, failed to give the compensations. Uh, the interesting part about this is that when the local community appealed to the Japanese courts, the Japanese states clearly states that uh, the case is closed in Indonesia, so it's not their problem. So it's a sign that uh, the investor country do not want to get into the kind of uh, local disputes. Uh, San Roque Dam is a failed project in terms of Japanese financing. It's still uh, completed by other banks, uh, Chexim in fact, but uh, it's uh, suspended by, in terms of Japanese finance. <laughs> And the uh, part of this is that uh, it's multinational project co-financed by the U.S. And uh, the fate of the project actually changed because of the administrative change in Philippines. The new government launched an uh, anti-corruption campaign targeting some of the previous uh, environmental evaluations, including this one. And uh, uh, besides, the local resistance is relatively fierce. So uh, the project didn't come into place. However, uh, local resistance themselves cannot stop a project, as we can see in the Morovi Dam. Morovi Dam, similar to Koto Panjan, is a successful project in terms of completion. Uh, this dam is located in Sutan and is financed by Chinese uh, and co-financed by a variety of countries, including Sutan itself. And the government at that time was authoritarian and used the coercive force to uh, destroy the local uh, community. So despite international 
pressures and very organized uh, resistance that even got some attention on UN level. Uh, the dam is finally completed, and uh, the Chinese do not suffer a lot despite the local uprising, uh, similar to Koto Panjang. So these are the successful case. When the government want to do it, host government want to do it, they do it. And the Song Dam is, of course, failed and uh, sus is suspended, and uh, opposingly, uh, originally get governmental support, but uh, later the government when uh, regime changed, and Chen Xin sided with the local rebels instead of the Chinese financiers. The Chinese did try to uh, to salvage the project by diplomatic channels. So similar to Koto Panjang, uh, they are consciously supporting that, but uh, the support was not very successful, and uh, uh, the case is closed so far. Uh, the, the, the dam is uh, suspended so far. West City is a very a different case because it uh, is a case that uh, never comes into contract. It's similar to the uh, Dutch uh, university we talked about yesterday. So uh, there are uh, the place itself is just not economically feasible for uh, building a dam. So it's a, a earthquake frequent area, uh, ecologically fragile, and there are strong local resistance. Nepal government really want to do it. They originally hired ADB and the Australian. Australian bank, but they are crowded out because of a scandal. So the Chinese are later contacted, but they decide to not enter, uh, even though the host government is strongly uh, encouraging that uh, because the expected environmental and social costs are uh, actually too high. So the overall summary of these cases is that uh, the projects are overall are proposed by recipient, even in cases like Maison, they originally proposed to Japan and multiple countries before they finally decide to let uh, to uh, give the contract to China. And the fate of the project was ultimately decided by whether the recipient want to uh, want to complete it, uh, this, uh, except the extreme case of West City, which is not economically feasible. Uh, Portugal Panjian is the only uh, ODA case, but the Japanese court explicitly explicitly said on multiple levels that they do not want Japan to get involved in the dispute. Um, Misung Dam is a case where the Chinese want to do it, but uh, they cannot save the dam. Uh, there are some alternative explanations to that. Uh, one of the popular ones is raised by Maria Solis and uh, other sc uh, scholars studying Japan and China. And they say that uh, the home government can shape the, uh, the investment by limiting the choice of host country. For example, some people are criticizing China for only exporting coal-fired and hydroelectric uh, power plants instead of uh, um, green renewable energy ones. However, in those cases, uh, most of these projects are proposed by hosts in order to attract multiple investors. So I don't think that's really the case of uh, investors shaping the preference. And uh, further, Counterfactual study is still needed. So I'm doing one type of uh, comparative study, the cross investor country comparison, but cross recipient comparison is uh, also helpful. Some of the GDP center work from my professors and other colleagues uh, says that uh, uh, when the uh, when the host country has really good level of rule of law, such as Peru, the Chinese, cover, uh, the Chinese companies and financiers act uh, just as uh, good as uh, Western companies. But uh, that's a study for another day. So the overall implication about regarding to that question, are the constant decision of the state? Well, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but most likely no. And I say that because uh, uh, the banks, uh, because uh, throughout the cases, the uh, home country are relatively passive and inefficient in its effort of influencing the overseas investment. And the financiers themselves, even being state-owned, are mostly driven by profit and the project proposed by uh, the host country. Host country is, of course, the most active actor here. And uh, its swaying attitude can change the fate of project, as uh, we can see, maybe see, in some of today's presentations. And this, of course, will lead to further questions about how the government uh, uh, regulates its agents. But that's a topic for another day. So thank you very much for your listening. Thank mm -hmm. you.